Dinesh D'Souza is a best-selling author and award-winning filmmaker. His political documentaries, 2016, Obama's America, and America, Imagine a World Without Her, are among the highest grossing political films of all time. An immigrant who grew up in Mumbai, India, Dinesh came to the United States in 1978 as an exchange student. He attended Dartmouth College, graduating Phi Beta Kappa. He was a domestic policy analyst at the Reagan White House and was also a scholar at think tanks such as American Enterprise Institute and Hoover Institution at Stanford. He teamed up with wife Debbie to produce a daily podcast which debuted January of 2021 and is a part of the Salem Podcast Network. In May of 22, D'Souza teamed up, D'Souza Media teamed up with True the Vote to bring light to the most important movie in America called 2,000 Mules. It was released the first week of May 2022 and became a huge blockbuster. Dinesh has written over 25 books and has made six movies. His latest book, 2,000 Mules, is based on the movie released at the end of October 2022. Dinesh and Debbie live in the Lone Star State together and have three grown children. Please give a great PLC Pennsylvania welcome to Dinesh D'Souza. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It is a, um, it's a great honor and a great privilege to be here. The evening started out with Vivek Ramaswamy. It looks like Indian American night in Pennsylvania. <laughs> All that was missing was the chicken tikka masala on the menu. <laughs> As I was um, chatting a little earlier, somebody came up to me and posed a question that, that startled me because it kind of forced me to think about the America I came to as a teenager and America now. The question was, what would Dinesh now, today, say to the young Dinesh who first came to America if I could somehow talk to him? And it, it flashed my mind back to my first experience of America. Because as I thought about that question, it occurred to me that the answer for me which is both a little inspiring, but also a little frightening, is I came to assimilate to a country that seemingly no longer exists. And in a way, I want to tell you what that predicament means for me and for us, because it puts us in a very different situation than Americans of earlier generations. We can look for parallels to our situation in the past, but none of those parallels is fully applicable. In some ways, we have to find our own way. Now, when I first saw America, I was, I was 17. I was um, arriving in New York by way of making my way to Arizona as an exchange student. I saw the skyline of New York, and a very strange feeling came over me. I thought to myself, I am moving from the margin of the world to the center. I am coming to a country that is really like no other country. 
I didn't know a whole lot about life in America, but I knew a fair amount about America's role in the world. There's a line in Shakespeare's uh, Measure for Measure, oh, it is wonderful to have a giant strength, but tyrannous, tyrannical, to use it like a giant. Every other country that has had this kind of giant's power in the world has used it to abuse other people, destroy other countries, create massive tyrannical empires. But I thought to myself, the strange behavior of the United States is it doesn't do that. It doesn't act that way. And so I was very entranced by the idea of America. I knew that if I stayed in the country, my life would be completely different from that moment on. I knew, even though I wasn't political in any way, that I was coming to a country where I could be the architect of my own destiny. A country in which I could be in the driver's seat of my own life. I went off to Arizona to live with the host family, attend public school in a small town called Patagonia. And my host family says to me, Dinesh, we're very excited you're here. We have planned a lot of sightseeing for you. We're going to go to the Grand Canyon. Uh, we're going to take you to Tombstone, Arizona, the site of the gunfight of the OK Corral. And I was like, guys, this is, a, this is great. But my idea of sightseeing is to go to the local supermarket. <laughs> I want to check out like 17 types of cheese, <laughs> or 40 types of ice cream. I was really stunned at the, the abundance that America made available, not just to the rich guy, but to the ordinary guy. I looked at ordinary Americans, you know, who were not that smart. A little lazy. And I noticed even those guys have two cars in their garage. Even those guys have really nice houses with central heat, sometimes a little pool in the backyard. And I'm like, wow, this is amazing. This is the abundance of America. I have an acquaintance in Bombay, India. This dude has been trying to come to America for I don't know how long. Never gets a visa. I guess I should tell him to show up at the southern border. <laughs> Practice his backstroke. But well, one day, I said to him, I go, hey, why are you so eager to come to America? He goes, Dinesh, I really want to move to a country where the poor people are fat. Now, this is the prosperity of America, but I think for immigrants, and I think Vivek would back me up on this, as would many others, the real beauty of America isn't just the chance to move up in life, but it's the chance to make your own life. In most parts of the world, and most of Europe is like this even now, your destiny is to a large degree given to you. Not that you have no choice, but the choice is kind of within, within confined parameters. In America, I realized, your destiny isn't given to you, it's constructed by you. Your life is more like a blank sheet of paper, you are the artist, wow. This is a country that has a dream, the American dream. I don't think the Chinese have a dream. I know the Indians don't have a dream. The, the dream of my generation of the 1970s in India was basically how to get the heck out of India. The French might have a dream, but I don't think I want to know what it is. But. But we have this American dream. 
And for me, the dream was ignited by one man whom I first encountered in college. I went to Dartmouth, Ivy League College that was apparently founded to educate and Christianize the Indians. I don't quite know how I got there. I think I might have misread the catalog. <laughs> but while I was there in New Hampshire, here comes this implausible figure, Reagan, in 1980. And something about that man uh, captured my imagination, not even because of himself, but because I thought, that Reagan was sort of America embodied. Reagan represented what to me was the quintessential American. And so I became a young Reaganite in, in those years. And it was, I have to say, a different time. And a kinder, gentler America. I don't know if you remember, well, I'm going to harken back for a moment to 1982. Reagan is president, but the country plunges into a recession. Basically, Paul Volcker, the head of the Federal Reserve, had squeezed the money supply. And it was, a, it was a painful and deep recession. Reagan gave a speech, after which he was accosted by Sam Donaldson of ABC News. Some of you remember Sam Donaldson. He goes, Mr. President, in your speech, you have blamed the Democrats, you have blamed the economists, you have blamed the media. Does any of the blame belong to you? And Reagan goes, well, yes, because for many years I used to be a Democrat. <laughs> and, and I recall this now with a little bit of nostalgia, because I remember even Sam Donaldson, who kind of couldn't help being Irish, kind of began to sort of laugh and chortle, and it was sort of a good old Irish, you know, you got me with that one. So Sam Donaldson chuckled, and Reagan chuckled, and it was that moment of American affability that defined the era. Even, even Reagan's relationship with Tip O'Neill, combative in politics, but affable in a certain sort of Irish way. Reagan would say things, well, Tip, you know, you're, you're a lot like the government. You're big, you're fat, you're out of control. <laughs> and Tip would sort of laugh it off. Now, I would like to tell you that that is the America that we have now. But it is the beginning, I think, of political wisdom to realize that we no longer live in Reagan's America. For me, as an immigrant who has done remarkable things with my life, exciting things, things that my father and my grandfather would not really have believed. I think if I went to my grandfather and said, you know, I'm going to make a movie with Lionsgate Films and I'm going to make it the uh, second most successful political documentary of all time and I'm going to make $33 million in the box office, my grandfather would have asked my grandmother to get the thermometer and like take my temperature. <laughs> and yet, for me, having experienced the American dream in all its different facets, I also have to say I've now experienced the other side of America. I've stood in a courtroom and heard the following phrase, which really no immigrant wants to hear. United States of America versus Dinesh D'Souza. Yikes. And. Um, and all of this, of course, was for my great heinous offense, which was to support a college friend of mine who's running for office. I exceeded the campaign finance limits. I gave her $20,000 over the limit. 
And okay, you know, we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't exceed the law. And so I find myself sitting across from some prosecutors at the Southern District of New York. These guys were working in coordination with Eric Holder. And, uh, and they were like, Dinesh, you've exceeded the campaign finance laws. And I go, yeah, I, I did, regrettably, and I should, I'm willing to take whatever penalty you'd normally give to somebody else who did the same thing. And, and that's when I get the good old not so fast. And I hear someone say, well, you know, we could get you on bank fraud. And I go, bank fraud? They go, yeah, because you took your money out of your bank account. And I was like, huh? And they go, you know what? We can also get you on mail fraud. And I go, mail fraud? And they go, yeah, because you put your check in the mail. And so I turn to my lawyer, and I go, what, what's going on? He goes, well, what they're doing is they're taking laws that were passed to go after ISIS and the mafia, and they are deploying those against you. He goes, they don't see you as a critic, a dissident, a well-meaning member of the opposition. No. <coughs> no. They see you as an enemy, and they want to take you out. So as I look at these guys, I'm sort of taking in the situation. I realize that if these guys could have put me in prison for 20 years for doing what I did, they would have done it. That, that was eye-opening for me because it told me that my whole civics book idea of America that I had entertained for the previous 20 years was, if not wrong always, was at the very least obsolete now. Why? Because what I was seeing up close, and by the way, this was all early on. This is before, this was the early case, the, the preview to what would come later with George Papadopoulos and Carter Page and Michael Flynn and then Trump. And so I realized this is a gangsterization of the other side that is beginning to show its face. I still didn't think we lived in a police state, none of that. All that later. But at the time, I thought, this is not good. But I still saw it as kind of a one-off. Because I thought, listen, I made a movie about Obama, my first film. 2016 Obama's America. And I made the film in a sort of an unusual way. It wasn't a critique of Obamacare, none of that. I was like, listen, I'm going to go inside Obama's world, and I'm going to go inside Obama's head, and I'm going to make him go nuts. <laughs> that was my goal. I'm going to discombobulate this man and drive him crazy. <laughs> now, the way to do that was actually not hard. I show up at the Obama homestead in Nairobi, I, actually a small town called Kogelo. I'm trying to interview Obama's grandmother who lives in a sort of a, a kind of a village. And she says that she will consent to an interview but only if I bring her a goat. And so in the film, you can see me. I'm, I'm dragging a very unwilling goat <laughs> to my Obama family homestead interview. And then I interview Obama's brother, who's living in slumdog millionaire conditions in a hut in Nairobi. So, and I contrasted that with Obama's, ah, oh, we are a brother's keeper. Cut to Dinesh talking to Obama's actual brother, who's essentially living on $2 a day and can't feed his own kids. And I'm like, what has Obama done to keep you? Nothing. So this, this upset him. 
And, uh, you know, when I speak in college campuses, <coughs> young people will say to me, oh, Dinesh, I mean, come on, really, Obama? What makes you think you watch your stupid movie? And I go, well, when my film was out, it was in 2000 theaters, and I was being attacked every day by name on a website called barackobama.com. <laughs> so that's where I get the idea that I aggravated the vindictive narcissist in the White House. And I was kind of dumb because I should have known there was a target on my back. And I should have known that if you aggravate Obama, the empire is going to strike back. Now, all of this is a way of saying that we are now in an America where one side has become fully gangsterized. Fully gangsterized. <clears throat> And virtually all of our strategies for dealing with the opposition are based upon the idea that they are well-meaning but deluded. Even right here at dinner, what are some things that we can do to fix the election laws? <coughs> so many other countries can fix their election laws overnight. It's not that we can't fix our election laws. It's not that we lack the knowledge. It's that one party benefits from systematic and coordinated cheating. And that party will do everything it can to block any effort to fix the election laws. And if you don't realize that, you're engaging in a sort of a fruitless enterprise. Throughout the Obama years, and even now, you have all kinds of people who are, in effect, lecturing the Democrats. Confiscatory taxation is not a good idea. All this promiscuous spending is not a good idea because, guess what? It'll drive up the deficit. The underlying premise, completely false, is that the other side cares at all about any of this. They don't. They have no interest in it. It's obvious. And this now has to do with all of our problems from the border. Again, is it that we don't know how to seal the border? We do. Is it that we don't have laws to seal the border? We do. It is that, it is that the gangster I side benefits from a porous and open border. And it doesn't matter how much we shriek about child trafficking and uh, the MS-13 gangs. They have decided, as the old Marxists used to say, that if you want to make an omelet, you have to break some eggs. So their idea, just avert our gaze from all that stuff. Not that we are for it, we just don't care. Our goal is what we have to single-mindedly pursue. And I got to say that a little part of me has to respect the single-minded ruthlessness of these gangsters. They're real gangsters. They know how to be gangsters. I kid you not when I say that if they had the ability to take all of us in this room and lock us up for a year just for being here, they would do it. They would do it. That's how they think. Now, this to so many of us is so preposterous that we have difficulty getting our head around it. We kind of can't believe it. It's kind of like if I were to tell you and this is the point of my most recent film, Police State, that there are ordinary guys, not Trump, ordinary guys going about their business, and these are guys who wake up at 6 in the morning, their front door is bashed open, FBI agents and police and people with armored vests and automatic weapons as a helicopter overhead. They're dragged down the stairs and into the street where their neighbors come and gawk at them. 
And this is happening in America, and it's happening regularly. And if I tell you this, you're like, I don't even know how to think about that. Because if it hasn't happened to you, if you've never heard the helicopter over your living room, it, it, it's a little surreal. It's like being in a movie. You can't believe it. Now, this brings me to kind of the heart of my message to us as conservative activists. What is it that drives the complete and naked chutzpah of the other side? I mean, what makes them, what makes them feel confident that they can run roughshod over free speech? What makes them think that they can stack the court? What makes them think that they can take the leader of the opposition party and hit him, not with one, not with two, but with 91 criminal charges, put him in jail for life? Something unheard of in this country's history. What makes them think that they can mobilize and militarize the intelligence agencies of the government and turn them against Republicans and patriots and conservatives and Christians. What gives them the guts to do that? And here, my <clears throat> somewhat dismaying answer is that what gives them the guts is us. Us. You've heard the phrase uh, critical race theory. Now, let's put aside the race part for a moment and just focus on the word critical. Critical means analytical. You, you look and you watch. And for the past 20 years or more, the other side has been critically watching us. And what do they see? They see that we are, from their point of view, the party of the nice guys. We're the party that wants to meet them halfway. We're the party that wants to live and let live. We're the party that says things like, we will have a president who will represent all of you, as well as all of us. We are the party of turn the other cheek. What I'm getting at is from the point of view of these hard and ruthless people, we are the party of the Namby Pambies. And it is our passivity, it is our bovine stupidity, it is our obstinate, chronic unwillingness to face the situation we find ourselves that is the prime motivator of their aggression. In the same way that the bully is motivated by the fear that he sees in the eyes of his targets. And they begin to retreat and the bully begins to advance. Now, our leaders and the people that we constantly extol were not like us. They were people who recognized the seriousness of their situation. George Washington was facing a British army much stronger than his own. And in fact, truth be told, if the British had deployed their full power against Washington, there is no way he could have won. The American Revolution would have been finished before it got started. It wasn't some brilliant military maneuver. It's just that George Washington realized that the British would never fight America with the same determination that they fought Napoleon. It was too far away, and they didn't care as much. So you didn't have to beat them outright, which the United States could not do. You simply had to harass them. You simply had to make it more painful for them to stay than to leave. And a guerrilla war was suited to that purpose. And so Washington realized, that's kind of the war we have to fight. We have to inflict enough pain on them that they're going to want to pack up and go home. Abraham Lincoln, well, he sort of started out on the namby-pamby side, I have to say. He was sort of what we would today call a rhino. 
What I mean by this is that the real fire-breathing Republican was the New York, was Seward. But Seward, before the Civil War, had given a rather tactless speech in which he had called the irrepressible conflict, and the Republicans ran scared. He's sounding a bit like an extremist. Let's go get the rhino from Illinois who has a softer image, and they got Lincoln. But very interestingly, when Lincoln came to Washington, Lincoln realized that the Democratic Party had become fully gangsterized. And so when the Civil War came, this is one of the ironies of history, Seward essentially went rhino. Seward said, let's work it out with the South. We don't really want a civil war. Let's compromise. Let's extend the Mason-Dixon line all the way to California. Slavery south of the Mason-Dixon line. No slavery north of it. Everybody can live with that. And the person who said no was Lincoln. Now, a couple of years later, in the early 1860s for the first time, the Union Army deploys black troops. If you've seen the movie Glory, it's a kind of snapshot of that. There weren't a lot of black troops and the Civil War was a white man's fight. But there were some. But the Confederates were outraged. Their view was, it is so insulting for us to even have to fight against black troops that they, they issued an edict, Jefferson Davis signed it, any black Union soldier captured by the Confederacy will be executed. And this came to the attention of Lincoln. And Lincoln issued what, uh, he issued a declaration that I dramatized in one of my films. You can see Lincoln, he's boarding a train, he's enveloped in smoke. And, um, do you mind passing me a tissue, please? Or just a napkin. Oh, and just off the table. Oh, yeah. Are you sure? <laughs> Thank you. This sometimes happens to me when I get into it. <clears throat> Lincoln issued what historians call the order of retaliation. Order of Retaliation, 1863. For every black Union soldier captured and executed by the Confederacy, one Confederate captive will be shot. Now, why would a moderate man like Lincoln issue an order of such evident barbarity? An order that today could never survive the Geneva Convention shocking in its implications. But, and this is why I'm telling you this, Lincoln's view was you have to do to them what they are doing to us. Because, because if you don't, they will never stop. They will never stop. Another way to put it is that we are faced with a sort of unprecedented situation that we haven't seen in our lifetime when we have people who are not interested in playing by the rules. And it's not even the, the leadership. The leadership is backed up by the rank and file. Go to rank and file Democrats and say basically this. If you could lock up Trump for the rest of his life on a reason that we don't even have to speculate about. Let's just say that you had the power to do it without a trial. Would you do it? And a lot of them will go, absolutely. We will do it. Why? Because they have been putting out the propaganda that our side is the party of autocracy. We are the autocrats. Trump is the uber autocrat. Now, if Trump is a dictator, 
He's literally the worst dictator in the history of the world. I have never seen more dictatorial incompetence than from that man. What dictator isn't running his own DOJ? What dictator loses an election and has to vacate his office? What kind of tin pot dictatorship are we talking about? Trump isn't running the police state, he's running from the police state. So that doesn't even make any sense. But my point is that there is now in place a system of gangsterization at every level. Censorship is one side of it, political targeting is another, election rigging is a third. And our approach, again, needs not only to be retroactive. Hey, Dinesh, what are we going to do to stop the mules in 2024? As far as I know, there were no mules in 2022. Why? Because there were a lot of patriots who were sitting at the drop boxes with their iPhone, and they were like, we're waiting for mules. You show up with a satchel of, of, of ballots, we're gonna be taking your photo. You're gonna be on social media. And the Democrats knew that, so they're like, time to move to another strategy. It's called the paper size doesn't really fit the printer in Maricopa County strategy. And this only happens on election day where conveniently everybody from Cal Kerry Lake to Abe Hamaday to Trump, Republicans, save your votes and go out on election day. The Democrats are like, perfect. That's when we spring our trap. And in 2024, it could well be something completely different. So the point being, not just that we need an RNC that goes, we need to do some absentee ballot harvesting. Really what we need to do is start thinking like the other guy. What we really need to do And the Bible says we should be wise as serpents, a line that we often recite, but a line that we never think the implications about. Because being wise as a serpent means seeing the world from the serpent's point of view. And not only that, but recognizing that you have to do what is needed to defeat the serpent, and that may call, for, call on you not only to act differently, but to think differently, and I'll go further, to be a different kind of person. Now, this I think brings me to the, the real conundrum of Donald Trump. The conundrum of Trump is that Trump doesn't fit that well with the psychology of traditional, the traditional Republican Party in which I came up, and the reason that Trump doesn't fit it is Trump is actually almost preternaturally made for this new situation. He not only lives in it, he thrives in it. He's, it makes him extremely dangerous to the other side. Their belief is that what they have done to him divided by 10. Not 91 indictments, not even nine indictments. One indictment would have crushed any other candidate on our side and caused them to go under the table, assume the fetal position, and exit the race. Everybody. So now you have to ask, what's, what is it about Trump? And what it is about Trump is, first of all, <clears throat> don't quite know how to say this, but there is a line in Lincoln's Lyceum speech where he talks about the temptation to be a Caesar, a temptation to be a Napoleon. And many people think that Lincoln is talking about the Democrats, and he is. 
and the breakdown of the rule of law, and he is. But he's actually also talking about himself. He's saying, I know that I, Abraham Lincoln, do have the power to run roughshod over the Constitution if I chose. The left keeps saying of Trump, he, 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 he did an insurrection. No, Trump didn't do an insurrection, but guess what? He's actually the only man in the country who could do an insurrection. If anybody else called for an insurrection, nobody would come. <laughs> Ted Cruz calls for an insurrection. Four guys show up. And they want to be paid. The point is, there's something about Trump, for better or worse, that is a force of nature. It's larger than life, and the Democrats believe, and I think they're right, that any other Republican, they completely know how to lash and whip and beat into submission, except Trump. In fact, not only do the Democrats know this, every other Republican knows this. If you want to know why Republican leaders frequently betray us, stab us in the back, turn on us, it's not because they're rhinos. Mostly it's because they are terrified of the media. Because they know, Mitch McConnell knows if the media puts him in their sights for six weeks and they thrash him nonstop, they batter him, they go into his tax records, they go after his wife's businesses, they, they go after him the way only the left knows how to, our own side will bury him. Our leaders know that and they live in perpetual fear of it. I think the thing about Trump, it's sort of like wrestling with Trump. Taking on Trump is a bit like wrestling with a pig. Because not only does it get everyone dirty, but the pig likes it. <laughs> the thing about Trump is the normal Republican move, you're calling me a dictator, let me show you seven ways in which I'm not a dictator. Trump could easily say, can you name a Democrat, a prominent Democrat that I locked up when I was president? You notice Trump never attempts to even give these rebuttals. Instead, it's like he taunts the other side. Well, maybe I'll be a dictator for a day. <laughs> and so he takes people who are already freaked out and he freaks them out more. He makes them nuts. You know, if, um, if at the end of this event, I go on social media and I post tonight, I was speaking at the Pennsylvania Leadership Conference, great crowd of patriots. Within 30 seconds, 10 leftists will be on my feed and they will be bashing me and you. Look at the audience, it's all white. <laughs> Look at all the people in the audience, they're at least 100 years old. Man, Dinesh, you've really put on some weight. <laughs> what happened, Dinesh, you know? So what I'm getting at is they're not, they're not criticizing me. Their goal is to degrade me, to humiliate me. They want me to say, hey, Dinesh, you're doing well. You don't really have to work. You have a good life. You don't really need this. Why are you doing it? They want to put that thought in my head. That's how they think. We never think like that. If Nancy Pelosi goes on right now, or Chuck Schumer, and they post, you don't have our guys immediately go on their sites and go, Nancy Pelosi, vodka Nancy. <laughs> Is your husband, you know, back in his underpants? <laughs> what about the other guy? How did he end up in his underpants? <laughs> your grandchildren are ugly. What I'm getting at is, we don't even think this way. I mean, I do, but 
mostly we don't. So, look, I want to show you, and I'll maybe round up with this, what these fights really look like and what it really means to win. <clears throat> I'll give you an actual example um, from a few years ago. When I made my film called America, Imagine a World Without Her, I wrote a book of the same title, and uh, my publisher decided to release it on the 4th of July, make it a kind of a immigrant celebration of America, a rational case for patriotism. My book comes out, the movie's about three weeks away. Book is out there, it's doing really well, hits, hits the bestseller list. And then I get a phone call from a friend of mine, a writer, and uh, he wrote, writes for a website called World Net Daily. And um, uh, he goes, Dinesh, um, he goes, your book has been pulled from every Costco in the United States. And I said, Actually, I said, um, that's not really likely. I said, first of all, Costco is not really a bookstore. They don't have to order my book. They're not Barnes & Noble. They have a few books that they choose. They've ordered my book in the past. It sells well for them. So they chose to order it. Why would they pull it? Makes no sense. Uh, and I said, moreover, I think I know what's happening. This happens to me all the time. You can Barnes & Noble. You basically have somebody working there who's a, you know, a weirdo, some guy with a, like a man bun, and the guy encounters my book and is, to use the modern parlance, triggered. He's triggered. So what does he do? He grabs the book and he like sticks it under the table so nobody will see it. I said, that's happened to me. I'm used to that. But no, it's not that. The journalist tells me, your book is unavailable in Costco from Alaska to Maine to, to Florida. And I was like, oh, let me call you back. And I call around to a bunch of Costcos. Sure enough, they've pulled my book. I thought to myself, how is that possible? Who would have that kind of power to go into a massive, multi-billion dollar corporation and pull my book? And so I looked into it. And I figured it out. The head of Costco, the CEO, is a guy named Jelonic. And this guy is a huge Obama fan. Has been invited multiple times to the Lincoln bedroom. One of the pleasures of the Lincoln bedroom, in case you don't know, you can jump up and down on the bed in the Lincoln bedroom. And so I think what happened is my book was in Costco all over the place, and then some Obamaite could be a Rah Rahm Emanuel, somebody like that, kind of waltzes into Costco. They see my book. They're triggered. They call up Mr. Jelonic, and they go, Mr. Jelonic, Obama's not going to be happy, so if you want to go back to the Lincoln bedroom, you might want to consider pulling Dinesh D'Souza's book. And so Mr. Jelonic does the good old cost-benefit analysis. I can sell a few more books and make a few dollars for Costco, or I can jump up and down in the Lincoln bedroom. I think I'm gonna go with the Lincoln bedroom. Boom, the book is pulled. So this is, how, this is the exercise of power at the highest level. Now, that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is how do we hit back? Now, our normal way of hitting back is to put it mildly useless. It basically involves things like, someone will come up to me and they go, Dinesh, I don't shop at Target anymore. I've canceled my subscription to Disney Plus. And I go, well, have you sent an email to all the managers of your local Target? Did you get the emails of the board of directors of Target and send them an email about why you're no longer... Oh, no, 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 I didn't do any of that. I just don't really go there anymore. And I'm like, well, what do you expect to happen? I mean, do you think that the manager of Target is going to come out one day and say, we haven't seen Mrs. Rosenstein in Target lately. She doesn't seem to come around that often. 
Could it be our transgender bathroom? Perhaps it is. They don't think like that. They don't care. They don't even know. So that's not going to work. So what is going to work? In this case, the journalist that I'm talking about um, wrote an article in World Net Daily, very effective, beautifully written, basically saying, immigrants book pulled on 4th of July. <laughs> kind of the perfect, that's the way to frame the issue, to cause outrage. And it did. People are furious. About a thousand people are raging on World Net Daily. We're going to cancel our subscription. We're going we're to cut up our Costco card. We're going to terminate our executive membership. Costco couldn't care less. Why? Because it's on World Net Daily. But then something happens in the history of social media that could actually be a Harvard Business School study because somebody in that online mob, I'm going to call it an online mob, somebody said, why are we, why are we raging over here? Let's all mosey over to the Costco website, Costco.com. Now, now we're talking because Costco does about one-third of its entire global business on Costco.com. And so what happens is that this right-wing snowball begins to roll toward Costco, but it's picking up snow along the way. So it starts off as 1,000 people. It's about 15,000 people when it hits the Costco site. And then begins a merciless trashing of the Costco site from top to bottom. I'm not talking about pompous sermons about the First Amendment or John Stuart Mill on liberty. I'm talking about the fact that these people went through every product at Costco. The food stinks, uh, the, the grill doesn't really work, the clothes are cheap and they don't fit. They trash every product in the product reviews, sending a giant wave of panic through Costco, and I find out about it because my publisher calls me and they go, Dinesh, Mr. Jelonic, the CEO of Costco, has called an emergency meeting. He wants you to fly up to Seattle to meet him to talk about this. So me and my partner, Bruce Cooley, were at the San Diego airport waiting to go up to Seattle when suddenly an, a familiar figure shows up, my publisher, a genial, round-faced guy, and we're like, what are you doing here? He's like, oh, no, no, I'm, I'll be joining you. I'm going to the meeting. And he goes, guys, we need a plan. And he says, our plan is essentially sweet persuasion. Our plan is to try to convince Costco that they've made a mistake and they need to reverse course. And so Bruce and I look at each other and we said to this guy, a really nice guy, we go, we're glad you're coming to the meeting. Your job is not to speak. Do not say a word, a word. We fly up to Seattle, we walk into the Costco office, the door flies open, there's Mr. Jelonic, kind of a little guy, you know, five, six or something, and his hair is all tuzzled, you know, it's all as if his hands have been going through it. He's sweating. He has a tie on, but it's, it's sort of like this, it's like it's, it's about four inches from the top. It's like the manager of the old Montgomery Ward. Can I help you? You know, and, and as I walk in, he points at me. He goes, you are destroying Costco. I think to myself, I am single-handedly destroying a multi-billion dollar corporation? Great. What could be more fantastic? I mean, who's next? So... So I sit down, and then he goes, oh, Dinesh, I don't know. You've been going on Hannity. You've been going on Megyn Kelly. You're, you know, you're, you're blackening our reputation. And I go, he goes, you know, our trustees are meeting. He goes, you know, I could get fired over this. And I said, Mr. Jelonic, if I was one of the trustees, I would certainly fire you. I go, you're obviously the worst CEO in America. I go, you have a brand with tremendous brand loyalty. People will buy the executive membership and spend thousands of dollars at Costco in the ensuing year. You make a ton of money over a single executive membership, let alone tens of thousands of, it, of them. 
So I said, I'm not the problem. You have pissed off your own customers. What does that say about you? And he's like, well, what are, you, what are your demands? And I go, what do you think I'm, Jesse Jackson? I don't have any demands. I go, I don't care if you stock my book. I don't really sell a lot of books in Costco. I mainly sell on Amazon, in Barnes & Noble. I'm already on the bestseller list. So I go, keep the book, don't keep the book, who cares? And I leave. And, uh, and, then, and then when I get to San Diego, my publisher's on the phone already. They're like, what happened? I'm like, well, what do you mean? They go, well, we just heard from Costco. Well, they've not only reversed their decision to not stock your book, they've apparently ordered 25,000 more copies. And when we inform them that you have a film coming out in three weeks, they have agreed to construct special standees in every Costco in the country. So everybody else's DVD is on the big table, but yours is going to be featured. So anyone coming in the store will see it immediately. <clears throat> now, I only mention this because this is an object lesson in the exercise of power of power. And it takes a certain savvy mind to fight this way. And it's the only way to fight. And it is the way that will give us enormous success. And we're capable of it. The opposition to it is inside ourselves. So when Vivek says, let's sacrifice, look, it's not a matter of calling us to painful sacrifice. It's calling us to recognize what the other side is trying to do and to beat them at their own game. That's the key. So always think clearly. What, what is their goal? Like, what is their goal with Trump? Well, Dinesh, they want, to, they want to lock him up. Yeah, but why do they want to lock him up? Well, they're, they're, trying to, they're trying to defeat him. They're trying to humiliate him. Yeah, but why are they trying to defeat him? Their goal is to prevent him from becoming the 47th president of the United States. That's their goal. With me, what's their goal? Well, their goal, Dinesh, is to give you mandatory psychiatric counseling. That's not their goal. Well, their goal is really to, I mean, that would be their goal if they thought it would work. If, if I went to mandatory psychiatric counseling and then emerged as Rachel Maddow on MSNBC, you know, call me Denise, I'm now trans, I would have been a success story of the left. But they knew that was not going to work. They even knew that incarcerating me is useless. In fact, as I told my friend Bruce, I go, you know, I'm going to spend eight months and overnight confine me with a bunch of criminals. He goes, Dinesh, you're from India. And quite honestly, I think it's true, because my attitude, my attitude going into that place was, you know, this to me is similar to being an anthropologist who is being parachuted into Papua New Guinea. I'm going to be in a really strange place with a lot of fairly barbarous natives. And these are people who don't speak except in like grunts. And they have views, but they're mainly inscribed on their bodies. I'm like, I just need to study this phenomenon. Keep a journal, do interviews. It's gonna be really interesting. But again, what is their goal? Their goal, destroy this man's career. If I was never, if I was not speaking here tonight, if I was, could never write another book, no publisher would touch me, if I couldn't make another movie, Lionsgate wouldn't distribute, their goal would be achieved. So I said to myself, Regardless of what happens, I don't care about the duration of my confinement, blah, blah, blah. I have to make sure that when I get out of confinement, my career is bigger than it was when I went in. And if I can accomplish that, I win.
And one, one final word about Trump before we close, because when, when Trump called me, this was about my pardon, it was very interesting because with Trump, there's always, you have to sort of get the subtext. Trump is, Trump doesn't speak in a normal fashion. Trump speaks whimsically. This is how he, it is. Hello, Dinesh. He goes, this is your favorite president. He goes, I'm here with John Kelly. You know John Kelly, don't you? I'm like, no. I, I know who he is, chief of staff, but I don't know the guy. And then he goes, oh, turning to the business at hand, he goes, your case. He goes, I knew it. Bullshit. <laughs> and, and, then he, and then Trump starts talking, and I realize I'm not even listening because I'm actually reading the subtext of what he's saying. And the subtext of what he's saying, which never explicitly came up, is what we are doing here, Dinesh, and the reason I'm doing it, is we are both delivering a giant up yours to the Obama administration. That's... That's the meaning of the transaction being, being carried out. Let me close this way. Um, many years ago, a professor of mine told me the story of the, the lion tamer and the lion. So here's the lion. Big, ferocious, scary animal. Here's the lion tamer. Wow. I mean, sort of a Justin Trudeau. By which I mean a beta male, a, a, a metrosexual, a, a puny guy with a stick. And, and here's the lion tamer doing this, you know. And here's the lion moving to the machinations of the lion tamer. Wow. And so my professor poses a very interesting question. Who is in fact more powerful, the lion tamer or the lion? Well, the answer is obvious, the lion. But now we have a mystery, because if the lion is more powerful, why is the lion sycophantically and obediently following the instructions and the orders of this lion tamer? And when you think about it, the answer comes to you. It's because the lion doesn't know its own power. The lion thinks the lion tamer is more powerful. Well, my message to you tonight, that is our situation. We are in the situation where we live in a certain kind of trepidation in which our desire for respectability, avoiding conflict, all of this keeps us in, in line, keeps us from being effective. It's not just a matter of, I'm going to fight, I'm going to sacrifice. It's a matter of recognizing that we are a prisoner, in a sense, of cages that we have created for ourselves. And all that the left has to do is point to them. And we run to the middle of the cage and go, okay, okay. I'm not going to question elections. I don't want to be an election denier. So this is rhetoric that is used to police our actions. The other thing about it is, it's not a matter of sacrifice. Let's learn to enjoy the fight. And that's a way of saying, when young people will come to me in college and they go, you know, I want to cause trouble. I go, okay, but causing trouble is an art. It's not just I want to cause trouble. It's like what Aristotle says about anger. He says anyone can be angry. But to be angry with the right person, at the right time, in the right way, for the right reason, that's not easy. And similarly, causing trouble, so I want to give you a kind of useful guideline for being a troublemaker. Try to think of what it is that will drive the left insane. <laughs> not disturb them, not trouble them or confuse them but actually cause them to lose their mind. 
think about that and do that repeatedly. Do that repeatedly. Why? Because it is the strategy of defeating the bully. The strategy of defeating the bully is to get in the bully's head. And then it is also to figure out ways, creative ways, in our case, political ways, to ambush the bully, to kick the bully in the shin. So the bully goes, hey, bullying isn't that much fun anymore. Why? Because these people are now the party of Lincoln again. They're going to do it to us, just what we've been doing to them. We might have to stop. Think of when Elon Musk took a bunch of leftists on Twitter. For one day, he banned them. They went insane. <laughs> and they became overnight apostles of free speech. <laughs> Quoting John Stuart Mill. Massive orations about free speech. Why? Because their free speech was threatened. Another way to put it, you cannot educate the other side about rights unless they believe their rights are imperiled. You know, let me give, as I close, the example of stacking the court. This is how the Democrats think. We're going to try to stack the court. We got, um, we got nine guys on there. Why don't we try to get 13 on there? We'll have, a, we'll have a, a majority for the foreseeable time. Now, normally, if someone did that, they'd have to worry. You know what? What if by some chance Trump wins the election? What if Republicans have both houses of Congress? They can stack the court. But the beauty of it is that the left knows that the party of the Namby Pambies will never stack the court. Because the Namby Pambies are wedded to nine. We believe in nine. It's not in the Constitution, but we love nine. So here's how they think. We try to stack the court. Even if we fail, no big deal. Because when the other idiots come in, they will hold that nine. Then we come in and we can stack it again. Now, if we campaigned and said, hey guys, listen, if you stack the court with nine, if by some chance we come to power, we will stack the court with 72, <laughs> they would be like, whoa, maybe this nine was not such a good idea after all. If Republican attorneys general start indicting prominent Democrats, if we start pulling by, I think the only reason the Supreme Court gave, came nine to zero on the Colorado case they realize that red states might start pulling Biden off the ballot. And they're like, whoa. So the more that they think that two will play at this game, the more they're going to act with sobriety. And the takeaway for this is something that's very critical here. We always think we're going to be protected by the Constitution. In some ways, Vivek even sustained that illusion. Let's, let's learn our history, read our Constitution. Our Constitution is a piece of paper. Our Constitution cannot by itself protect us. How can it? How can a piece of paper protect you when the other side takes the piece of paper and uses it as toilet paper? How can it protect you when they take a piece of paper and tear it into pieces and throw it into the trash? Our constitutional system is not the paper. It's the institutional arrangements, the checks and balances, the rational fear that the majority has of the minority and that the minority has of the majority. It is this actual exercise of power that is the key to our freedoms, not parchment protection. Don't pray that the Supreme Court comes out right. We want them to, yes. But ultimately, we also have to realize that any political arrangement is also a balance of power. We have to be more clever and creative and effective practitioners of that art. And if we do, I firmly believe that we will secure the American dream. We will make America great again. We will restore Reagan's beautiful idea expressed, I believe, in the 84 campaign. Morning in America. Thank you very much. Thank you.